praise the Lord. People of God, we want to give God the glory this morning for the blood of Jesus Christ that speaks better things than the blood of Abel. For we are justified to approach the throne of glory, the thrice holy God, by the blood of the Lamb. We join the saints of God in the throngs of angels and to worship him this morning and declare, heaven and earth adore you. We bow down before you. We cast what we deem to be crowns at your feet this morning as we join the 24 elders as they bow before you, casting down their golden crowns. And we say you are God alone. You are high and lifted up. There is no one like you. Forever and ever you are God. You are the Almighty, our friend, our Savior, our Redeemer, the Lord, our God, the God who is and who will be forevermore. Be thou magnified. Be thou magnified, O God, in what we'll be doing today. Lord, it is your word, and we are just privileged to be sharing this bread of life. And Lord, we shall be satisfied. You said you will satisfy us with the fatness of your house. We shall be satisfied this morning with the fatness of house. You are the light of life. We connect with that light this morning, that our lives shall be lighted up. The areas, the things the Holy Spirit will take us through to refine us, to transform us, to build us up, to edify us, will be for the praise and glory of your name. As we press in to make your glory known, as our hearts pant after making your glory known, Lord, you will help us. Sweet Holy Spirit, you are here to glorify Jesus. Help us to glorify him. Take the words of life and imprint it in our hearts. Transform us. Let God, our Father, be glorified in that which he wants to do in us and through us. In Jesus' mighty name. Amen. Hallelujah. What a beautiful day that the Lord has made. We have come together again to worship we thrive, we flourish in his presence. And God has been helping us. We've had wonderful virtual summits at the women's event. And we want to welcome all our online guests um, to this morning service, worship service, as the Holy Spirit will be teaching us and taking us into deeper revelations of what our Father Lord will want to address in our lives today. So I say welcome to everyone to Magnum Impact Christian Center, Chapel of Light. Um, it's our online worship service. And on behalf of the senior pastor, Dr. Peter Digby, welcome all of you once again. Um, I know some of you have um, caught up with him earlier this morning at 5 a.m. to 5.30 at the early morning prayer. Uh, and it must have been wonderful when he was sharing about uh, Jehovah Shammah, the God who is always there and will be seen over us. Thank you for coming online. This morning, to the glory of God, will be, and with the help of the Holy Spirit, we'll be looking at making God's glory known, godly parenting. Um, over the week, since last week, we have been looking at making God's glory known. Our service last Sunday addressed the issues of making God's glory known. And we saw there that God said, we have been created for his glory. We are a people formed for his praise, to display his glory. This has been reiterated many times in the New Testament. And Jesus Christ said, let your light so shine. And then we looked at what is the glory of God. And um, according to, God's, uh, to Strong's concordance, we saw 
the Hebrew word for glory is kabod, and it means weight, honor. Glorious abundance, riches, splendor, and the dignity of God. And this is what God has placed upon us. And this is what he wants us to display to the world. What a privilege, what a choice. He says, I call you mine, you are mine. Isaiah 43 verse one. Well, to the, today we are going to be looking at another aspect of that, making God's glory known through godly parenting. Godly parenting. <laughs> Parenting started from the Garden of Eden, and that was the first, the primary assignment that God gave Adam and Eve in the Garden. When he told them, be fruitful and multiply, Genesis chapter 1 verse 28, and God blessed them, God empowered them. And we are blessed by reason of the sacrifice of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. We stand as a blessed, we are blessed with all spiritual blessings in heavenly places through Christ Jesus. So we are empowered to do what he has asked us to do. I said, using all its vast resources in the service of God and man, I'm reading from Amplified Version, and have dominion over the fish of the sea and the birds of the air and all that. And so we know we are empowered to be fruitful and to multiply. We are empowered to do this primary assignment of godly parenting. We saw God trusted our covenant father, Abraham, with godly parenting. And in fact, God said, I know that Abraham will teach his children. This is chapter 18, 19. And of course, we. It, it, Jacob was a testimonial of that truth uh, because when Jacob was so far from home in spite of his conditions, he gave tithes, which was something that was a hallmark of Father Abraham. He gave tithes. Despite his distance from home and all that and his challenges, that didn't disturb him. He had been taught the precepts. And then we see in Deuteronomy chapter 6, and God commanded Israel saying, listen, O Israel, the Lord is our God, the Lord alone, and you must love the Lord your God with all your heart and all your soul and all your strength. And you must commit yourselves wholeheartedly to these commands that I'm giving you today. Repeat them again and again to your children. Talk about them when you are at home and when you are on the road, when you are going to bed and when you are getting up. Tie them to your hands and wear them on your forehead like front legs. Remind us. Remember, in Romans chapter 15, verse 4, Apostle Paul told us uh, in that scripture that whatever has been written in the past was written for our instructions. It says for whatever was written in earlier times was written for our instructions so that through endurance and the encouragement of the scriptures, we might have hope and overflow with confidence in his promise. And so we can't dismiss that and say, oh, well, he was talking to the Israelites. No. He was speaking to us too. And if you want to know more, listen to Jesus Christ in Matthew chapter 18. And you see how he valued children. He said, at that time, the disciples came up and asked Jesus, who then is the greatest in the kingdom of heaven? And see the example that Jesus gave, verse 2. And he called the little child to himself and put him in the midst of them. That's the greatest in the kingdom. And said, truly I say to you, unless you repent, change, talk about, and become like little children, trusting, lowly, loving, and forgiving, 
you can never enter the kingdom of heaven at all. And that's why we, uh, we have to be concerned about developments in, in the systems in the present world now where children are being polluted. They are meant to be preserved. They are meant to be taught in the purity of things. Jesus saw them as pure, as lowly, as forgiving, as trusting. And what a crime to abuse that trust. You will see what Jesus said. That anyone who abused that trust, it's better that the person had a weight tied to his neck and drowned. That's how critically important that is a mighty position that children hold in the hearts of God. It says, whoever will humble himself, therefore, and become like this little child, this trusting, lowly, loving, forgiving child, is the greatest in the kingdom of heaven. And whoever receives and accepts and welcomes one little child like this for my sake and in my name, receives and accepts and welcomes me. Whoever receives, accepts and welcomes a child, receive, accept, welcome a child, receives and welcomes Christ. That is why we appreciate, apart from the parenting of your biological children, I have, at this day, use this opportunity to celebrate those who also foster, those who adopt children. It's, it's a welcome thing, children. We've got to the same responsibility for godly parenting towards every child. For a believer, when you do that, you are inviting Christ, you are separate into your home. And what a joy to have the King of Kings, the Lord of Lords, the governor amongst the nations, the mighty God, the wisdom and the counsel of God in your home. <coughs> now, Jesus went on to say, but whoever causes one of these little ones who believe in me and acknowledge and cleave to me to stumble and sin, that is, whoever entices a child or hinders that child in right conduct or thought, it will be better, more expedient and profitable <laughs> for him to be a great millstone fastened around his neck and to be sunk in the depth of the sea. That's Matthew chapter 18, verse 6. And then in verse 10, Jesus went on to say, Beware that you do not despise or feel scornful towards or think little of one of these little ones. For I tell you, in heaven, your angels always are in the presence of, and that's why you don't need to worry. Their angels are in the presence of God. Look upon the face of my Father who is in heaven. I tell you from practical experience, no matter how much you love your child and you do anything, except the Lord watches over the city. The watchmen watch but in vain. We must first trust God and entrust these gifts of God unto him again in order to do right towards these children. And when you have that perception, then it's, parenting is no longer a struggle. Because sometimes you see some quips in the on cars, uh, on stickers and so on, making out as if children are a burden. They are the gifts of God. The gifts of God, God's gifts are good and perfect. And uh, the Bible says, the blessings of the Lord makes rich and adds no sorrow. So beware that you not despise or feel scornful towards or think little of any of those little ones. I remember um, when my 
son was a baby. I was so fussy, the first child. I was so fussy being perfectly in order for him and all that. And this day, I was the one playing with him in the bedroom on our bed. And he had such a horrible tumble. I couldn't fathom how it could have happened. But if it had happened in the hands of somebody else, I would have been so aggrieved. And that was a lesson for me, that this child, that you love him, trust God. Even when you're away at work and is with the au pair, trust God. And then there was another experience I had. Uh, we were at home and um, that was, and then I had this little child hawking something around our neighborhood and knocking on every door. Oh, I can fix your lamps and this for you. I can do that. And I was curious. That this voice sounds very much like a child's voice. What is this child looking for on the streets? And so I came downstairs and called him, beckoned on him. And he came and, and of course, he was trying to sell his wares to me. Then I said, no, what, why are you doing this? What happened? Where are your parents? And he said, oh, I've lost both my parents and my uncle has been very kind to us. He's been training us, but he can't afford my examination fees. And so I have to try and do this to raise the money. And with the help of the Holy Spirit, I had that amount of money that at home and I quickly ran upstairs and brought it and gave it to him. What a joy. It leaves a very good memory with me. And I'm sure that child has said yes about um, there's this, this group of young beggars in certain parts of Nigeria. And these young boys felt abused, continuing to be beggars, and they ran away from the beggars camp. They are called Almajuris in Nigeria. And then um, they ran away. But this man found them. And they were shoe shining to raise money so that they could go to school in another part of Nigeria. They had fled their state. They actually said they fled from a particular state. I don't want to bother you with that. And then this man found them and took up their responsibility. Do you know that today, one of them is a politician in the House of Representatives? And one of them, they are, and they are both married, the other one, became a lecturer. They went to University of, uh, of Ahmad Bello, Zaria, in Nigeria, because somebody took an interest in them. They were not even from the same ethnic group, these people who took interest in them and nurtured them. So whoever receives a child, well, I don't want to go to take much of our time but I believe you are following the interest with interest what God will have us do. So Jesus said, let the little children come unto me and do not hinder them, do not forbid them. Do you know that sometimes even we as Christian parents, we hinder them, we forbid them unconsciously. We say, oh, it's bedtime, you can't come along. Oh, it's your games time, you can't do this. And then we come alone to church and we go and do our Bible studies alone and then we stop them. Sometimes it's in our attitude. We need to examine ourselves because the child has been given to us to prepare them for a glorious future, to prepare them to show forth the praises of God, an inheritance from God as heirs of salvation. We receive them as gifts, as the heritage of the Lord. It is, it, it, it's, it's, it's a dangerous thing, as we saw from the scriptures earlier read, that to disturb, to hinder the access of a child to the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. Now in Psalm 127, and I would like to read it. I pray the anointing on the scriptures will break every yoke and every hindrance of confusion that we may have about our children. I'll read the entire chapter 127. Um, Psalm 127, it's very short, very few verses. And it says, except the Lord builds the house, 
the labor in vain will build it. Except the Lord keeps the city, the watchman watch it, but in vain. It is vain for you to rise up early, to take rest late, to eat the bread of anxiety, toil, for he gives blessings. He gives his beloved sleep. That's the, that's the God we serve. Now, verse 3 says, Behold, and that's a very important aspect of things. Behold, children are a heritage from the Lord, the fruit of the womb, a reward. As arrows are in the hand of a warrior, so are the children of one's youth, happy, blessed, and fortunate is the man whose quiver is filled with them. They will not be put to shame when they speak with their adversaries at the city gate. <laughs> Interesting. Now, children are the heritage of the Lord. <laughs> and it's so important to take note of this. Heritage means something that is reserved for a particular person or group. The outcome of a way of life. As believers, we are heirs of salvation. And our children are our gifts from God, either biologically or otherwise. The gift of God, like I said earlier, has no sorrow. When you begin to feel burdened by children or you feel drained, please go back to the vine. Go back to the vine and draw more sap. Our word for this year as a church is abiding in him. John 15 verse 5, it's very clear about our abiding in him. And when you abide in Christ, you, you can draw from the sap and be free from your concern and your burden concerning child upbringing. I, I pray you in your private time, look up some of the scriptures because uh, we're not going to go through every one of them. You know, now that scripture also says, They are like arrows in the quiver of a man, of a warrior. A quiver is like a pouch, and that holds the arrows in place until the archer is ready to release the arrows. And of course, any effective archer would have treated the arrows properly, to make them malleable, oil them, and then sharpen them so that when they hit the target, they achieve purpose. Because arrows are like weapons. Remember that scripture says, they will not be ashamed at the gates because they, they, you will have something to say to answer your enemies at the gate. <laughs> and so the person who treats the arrows properly, what a comparison. that they will be able to speak with their adversaries at the gate. Why? Because that you are happy, you are blessed, you are fortunate to have these arrows in your quiver. So children, to have children makes you, it, it makes you a blessed, happy, fortunate person in the sight of God. And there are children everywhere. You can adopt, you can foster, apart from being biological parents. Now, the Bible talks in Proverbs 22, verse 6. It says, train up a child in the way that he should go, and when he is old, he will not depart from it. You can link that with the picture of the archer working so hard and making sure his arrows are properly treated. 
and are in place to be released at the appropriate moment towards a, path, a certain trajectory and a target. So child training, parenting must be purposeful. And when the purpose of a thing is not known, abuse is not inevitable. That's why we started by reading those scriptures. And we can't be hypocritical about it. Uh, because interestingly, children are best at character reading. And to attempt to be hypocritical about it is to do exactly what Jesus said we shouldn't do. Is to offend them, is to disturb them, is to hinder them from coming to God. There are people who have seen activities in their homes, things happening, and they'll just say, okay, is this all you do in church? You smile at each other, and then you get back and sit, tear each other down? Well, when I'm old enough and I'm not compelled to come with you, I'm not going to go to your church. I'm not coming to church again. I won't. You know, and all sorts of things happen. Let's watch it. Let's examine ourselves. Let's be purposeful. Let's be intentional in our approach to church. Parenting, especially now that we know that it is for his glory. These children, they are a gift from God. Whatever, when a child is given, they are a good and perfect gift. Because, and the blessings of the Lord makes rich and adds no sorrow. So the when you are, if when the act to be able to prepare an arrow, the archer himself must have been well trained in the art. And so you are coming from some source, from a background of understanding. And that is why, as parents, we must allow the word of God to dwell in us richly. We must allow the word of God to dwell in us richly and to guide us in all our activities with our children in order to fulfill the purpose of God, this wonderful inheritance that God has given us. You know, when you are not hypocritical about what you are doing with your children, they will treasure your words. They will obey it. And for generations, they will keep, keep, they will keep passing on that truth. I remember the story of the Rechabites in Jeremiah chapter 35, when they were offered alcohol. And the Rechabites said, no way. Our forefather had, had said that we must not take alcohol and we will not take alcohol. It's a question of remembrance. And the, the child will remember whatever they have been taught if they value your words, if they see consistency in your approach to truth. And so we have a responsibility. Maybe I would read that scripture to us, Rechabites, in the obedience, the Bible is described as the obedience of the Rechabites in Jeremiah chapter 35, verses five to six and eight. Um, and then the article goes, I set cups and jugs of wine before them. I'm reading from the New Living Translation and invited them to have a drink, but they refused. No, they said, we don't drink wine because our ancestor, Jehonadab, son of Rechab, you see, they know their history, they know their ancestry because they have been taught. Let, let our children know their roots in Christ. Let's teach them, let's give it time. And then they said, our ancestor, Jehonadab, son of Rechab, gave us this command, you and your descendants must never drink wine. And so we have obeyed him in all these things. We have never had a drink of wine to this day, nor have our wives, our sons, or our daughters. Whatever he has told you is for you and your children, children forever. Joshua said he threw a challenge to the other to the Israelites when in his old age, 
I mean, he, he, because he was confident enough about what he had taught his children, he said, as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. Choose you this day who you will serve. But as for me, you are free to choose whatever you want. It's not a contest. But as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. It comes from somewhere. It comes from understanding. It comes from appreciation of what God has done, of the responsibility conferred on us by giving us these beautiful gifts. And so we saw the Rechabites. Friends, you are your children's primary teachers. You are their first teachers. You are their guide. You are their counselor. You are their primary influencer. So I've read an article somewhere where they counted the number of hours children spend in school and spend in church and at home. The largest part of their life when they are growing up is spent with you as their parents. Make good use of it. We can see the Rechabites and the power of influence and godly instruction. With consistency in what you do and what you say, your children will treasure your word through the years and pass it on to generations. Now, before we wrap it up, that your marriage is an essential part of your parenting. Children will think, okay, if mom doesn't agree, I'll go and talk to dad. Dad will take me shopping. Mom has said no, but I'll go and talk to dad. Don't let your children find one parent play you against one another. Make sure you confer with your spouse. Make sure you come to agreement concerning the children and let them see a united front. That will help them too in future in establishing their own home, in understanding unity, a one accord. So the one flesh principles continue even in your parenting. And then make sure they see genuine honesty, no clamoring and things that will upset them. Because then you'll be setting a bad example. Be intentional in creating time, quality time for your, with your children. It may mean not taking that job. It may mean not traveling for that event. But it's a sacrifice that is worth giving and making because it will yield to you in years to come. And not just to you, but to the kingdom of God a people formed for his praise. And not just for the kingdom of God, but also for the society, because the family is the bedrock of the society. So when we are able to make those sacrifices for our children, to nurture them right, they become a blessing, not just to us, but for generations and to the society. There's, been, the, the, there's a story of a family that cost the nation, the America, in the US, several, from generations, they, they were listed, that cost the nation several bi- millions in dollars because they were doing the wrong thing, they were in jail, they were this, they were that. And then there was another family at the same time that this observer, uh, noted in this uh, in this article, who produced senators, judges, doctors, and people who were a blessing to the nation. We have a choice. We have a responsibility to make sure this happens in our camp. The other thing I was telling talking to you about is being about being intentional and making sure you have quality time with your children, is you can also volunteer in their school, make time to be there, 
to see what they are being taught, to be present. Make sure you don't miss their parents' teachers' days. It hurts me when my children were in school and I see young children coming for parents' teachers' day and assessment day alone without their parents. It hurts. I just wonder what will this parent be doing that you wouldn't make time to come along with this child. To the glory of God, I, we made sure, my husband and I, that we never missed one event in the school. So teachers were able to tell us things and we're able to challenge and ask questions and know how to sharpen our arrows. Today, we give God the glory for what he's done and what he's doing in the lives of us children. Now, you can also choose to be a coach in a sport that your children are interested in. That will also be fun. Or it may not be a sport, it could be music, some other activities could be ballet, it could be dancing, but show interest and be part of it. Let them see what you do for a living. Let them understand. Make them part of your of the family daily responsibilities, no matter how young. I remember when uh, our son was uh, a toddler, when I returned from shopping, when I do bulk shopping for the family, even when he was in his pampas, they would come out, toddle out, and wants to pick something that carries something. He just wanted to be useful. And he has continued that attitude even now as an adult. Sometimes, and when your children do these things, don't shoot them away that, no, you're too young. Let them do, even if it's a little thing, you can give the child maybe your pencil to bring along or something, but it gives the child a sense of belonging, a sense of participation. And when your children have done something in the home, appreciate them, celebrate them. Even if it is just flushing the toilet or putting the toilet seat down or putting their potty away, celebrate them. Let them feel well loved and acknowledged as part of the family. Amen. The Lord bless you as you make this effort. Also, I want us to look at this practical, other practical issues. Do not turn your child's struggles to a struggle with that child. For instance, if a child is showing acts of discontent and all that, and um, you know that's his struggle. It's, it's not, he wants this, he wants that, he's just not satisfied with this and that. That's his struggle. Don't get, don't turn into a struggle with him by being also trying to be nasty or trying to, or, of speaking contrary words. Be guarded. Go around and pray. Pray for him. It's a struggle. But pray for him. But don't turn into a struggle with that child. Okay? That is very, very important. Watch your words and your reactions. Don't get provoked. We must do the right things when they do the wrong things. We must know how to forgive them. Look at the story of the prodigal son, and we're not going to read that, but I'll just give you the, uh, the passage and in your private time, you can please look at it. Luke chapter 15, verses 12 to 32. Where in that story, we see these practical lessons of giving children room to make mistakes. Although at the same time, you allow the natural consequences to teach them. But while you do that, you are putting a prayer cover over them. And also remembering that God says, great shall be the peace of our children, for they shall be taught of the Lord. So whatever seed you have sown in the past in, the key, in your children, the Holy Spirit will bring it up onto a remembrance wherever they go. That's why it says, train up a child in the way he should go, and he will not depart from it. It may look like is departing from it, but he can't depart because the word of God is anointed and it can it will achieve its purpose. It will not return to God void. Amen. So let's be confident in the word of God. We need to do that. 
and put that shield of prayer over them. Even while, even while we are not shielding them from what the consequences of their action, but we are shielding them in the spirit and with prayers. And the spirit of God will direct and guide them and deliver them. Because the Bible says the seed of the righteous shall be delivered. He said, our children are preserved from the evils of this present world. So no matter what goes on, when we have made that investment, let our hearts rejoice. Let our hearts be confident in God that he will do what he has promised concerning our children. He will do those things which, are, which we have spoken into his ears concerning our children. And they shall be for the praise and glory of his name. In the mighty name of Jesus Christ. In that Luke chapter 15, we also saw practical examples of a father forgiving, parents knowing how to forgive when our children have hurt us and not throwing them under the bus. We, we also saw the act of reinforcing the value of hard work and investments, and the father teaching the siblings how to accept one another. Talking about siblings accepting one another, I come to another practical issue, the issues of siblings rivalry. <laughs> I'm sure we all know something about, a little bit about this. It's all in the scriptures. We've saw several examples in the scriptures. We saw Cain and Abel, we saw Jacob and Esau, and all that. And um, even in the life of Jesus Christ, our Savior, his siblings didn't receive him initially. His siblings did not even believe in his ministry at first. Although, thank God, later on, after the crucifixion, we know from the scriptures that uh, they were, some of them were in the upper room and were baptized in the Holy Spirit and continued the ministry uh, in the ministry of Christ as Christians. Civil rival, civil, uh, siblings rivalry is, uh, uh, is the contrary thing to brotherly love. Uh, instead of brotherly love or sisterly love, we have a brotherly and sisterly conflict. But um, as parents, we have the wisdom of God. We can go back to God. As we abide in Christ ourselves, we can go to God and talk to God about it. We mustn't get caught in the midst of siblings rivalry. We saw the story of Joseph and his brothers and the coat of many colors. Let the challenge of siblings rivalry take us to prayer. We see uh, uh, in Genesis chapter 25, verses 2 to 24, Rebecca being challenged by the, the rivalry between her children, her sons, and even in the womb, she turns to prayer. Turn to prayer. Ask God, what do I do about this? How should I treat this matter? Don't into the tr uh, trouble. Don't get into the. Don't take sides. But receive wisdom from God on exactly how to handle them just like Rebecca did at that time. And God revealed to her what was going on. I tell you, God will reveal to you what is going on amongst between your children and you'll be able to address it with wisdom and love when you ask him. The other thing I want us to also note is technology. We are in a digitalized world, right from when, before they can even speak, they all have their tablets now and all that. But as parents, we must be very responsible in handling these things in, over to our children. These gadgets are all sorts of gadgets now. You yourself as parents will have to make time to research it, update yourself, be part of their activities, set filters, 
place guards on their devices. And as you do that, you will have tried your best in the practical way to guard their eyes and their minds. But there is also, but the most important as you do that is to guard their hearts. Because out of the heart comes all the issues of life. That's what the Bible tells us in Proverbs chapter 4, verse 23. Out of the heart comes all the issues of life. Thank God we will do all that, put all those things in place. But make sure you guard the hearts of your children by feeding, feeding them with truth. Memorize scriptures, speak the word at dinner. Remember what we read in Deuteronomy chapter 6? In your waking up and you're rising up, in your rising up and you're going to bed while you're on the road and while you're on the table, let the word of God dwell in you richly. Let them see it in your conduct, in your dressing, in your conversation, in the type of leisure activities you take. Let your children see the word of God dwelling richly in the home. The greatest need is the protection of their hearts. Out of the heart comes all the issues of life. Once the heart is filled with the right thing, wherever they go, whether you are there or not, they will do the right thing because that word of life will ooze out of them. The spirit of truth will come into play and take it out of them and show them the way that will go. It's a great shall be the peace of our children. They shall be taught of the Lord. Remember Samuel and Eli's children? Samuel lived with those wicked children that God was so offended with. But Samuel became the greatest prophet in Israel whose words never fell to the ground. Samuel was released into Eli's custody by the age of five. And that meant Hannah kept her promise to God that I will devote this child to you. And she taught him and prepared him. As we do these things, God will be glorified in our efforts. Wherever we have need, the spirit of grace will attend to us in the mighty name of Jesus Christ. God alone has the power to transform lives. Successful parenting does not come from programs, methodologies, and uh, techniques. Let us together choose to trust God and to pump, to, to enrich our own lives, examine our own lives, fill it with the truth, and then do the same to our children. Give them the word of life. Train them in the way that they should go, and they will not depart from it. You cannot afford to be double-minded friends, because a double-minded man cannot wield a double-edged sword. The word of God is a double-edged sword and it pierces asunder even between the bones and the marrows. Let us decide to be focused and single-minded as we wield the double-edged sword for victory in our parenting.